Hello, so now that we've looked at polar and non-polar molecules and how to identify the types of van der Waals forces in those molecules, and if you haven't checked out those videos already, you can go and find them on the Higher Chemistry playlist now because that information will be fundamental to what we're about to do now. So we're going to look into how all of these bonding structures that we've learned about affect the properties of substances and we're going to start off with how they affect melting and boiling points. So if you're ever asked about melting and boiling point of a substance, it all comes down to what types of bonds are broken or attractions are broken when the substance is melting or boiling. So in short, the stronger the bonds or attractions you're breaking, the higher the melting or boiling point is going to be. And that's why it's so important to be able to identify the structure and bonding within a substance before you go on to work out what the properties are then going to be. This is one of my favourite bits of chemistry because I honestly feel like it's some kind of cheat code <laughs> to understanding the world because someone could show you a molecule and with your knowledge of the structure and bonding within it, you'd be able to work out what its melting and boiling point would roughly be, whether it would be soluble in water or not, whether it would be very viscous, whether it would have a high or low volatility and to explore all of these other properties you can check out my other videos on the properties of bonding. To get started I've got this table here that summarises all the structures and then what is the strongest attraction that's broken when it melts or boils. So if a substance has a metallic lattice structure and generally this will be if it's a metallic element then you're breaking the metallic bonds. That's the only thing that's there to be broken. Metallic bonds are relatively strong, which means then the melting boiling point of metals tends to be relatively high. If you're breaking an ionic lattice structure, so that's an ionic substance where you have a metal and a non-metal bonded to each other, then you'd be breaking the ionic bonds. They're the only bonds there to be broken. And they are relatively strong as well, so therefore ionic substances tend to have high melting and boiling points too. So then we go on to covalent networks, that be carbon in the form of diamond and graphite, silicon, boron and also silicon dioxide is another one to remember. Um, so silicon generally always forms covalent network structures even when it's in compounds. When you're melting a covalent network then the only thing there to break is the covalent bonds. If you remember from National 5, these are extremely strong, which means the covalent networks tend to have the highest melting boiling points of all the structures. So they generally will always have melting points above a thousand degrees. So if you ever get asked about a substance with a melting point above a thousand degrees and you're asked why it's above a thousand degrees, it's because you're having, it's a covalent network, so you're having to break strong covalent bonds when it melts. Then we move on to covalent molecular substances. Now these are the tricky ones because it's very dependent on what the molecule actually is, but in short, you're always breaking some type of van der Waals force, so some kind of intermolecular attraction. If you have a monoatomic substance, so a noble gas element, then you'll be breaking London dispersion forces. So we often talk about noble gases not forming any bonds, and it's true they don't form any bonds between their atoms, but they will still have London dispersion forces acting between their atoms because they do still have electrons. So now we're going to start looking at some substances and compare their melting and boiling points. One of the most common ones you'll get asked about in the SK exam is the comparison of argon and chlorine. So they are right next to each other on the periodic table, so you'd expect their boiling points to be very similar, but chlorine is much higher than that of argon's. So argon's minus 189 degrees Celsius, whereas chlorine's minus 101 degrees Celsius. So for being that close to each other on the periodic table, it's quite a big difference. Now, the reason for this comes down to their structure and bonding. So remember I said anything to do with the reasoning behind melting and boiling points comes down to the structure and bonding within the substance. So what we first want to do when presented with a substance and asked about its melting or boiling point is we want to look at firstly what is its structure and then secondly, based off that, what type of attraction is broken when you're melting or boiling it. So if we start with argon, we know because it's a noble gas it has a monoatomic structure and you can use your colour-coded periodic table for this. And if you've not done that yet, then go and find my Structure of the Elements video and that'll take you through the colour coding. So, Argon's monoatomic, 
which means that when we boil it, we're only breaking London dispersion forces. Chlorine, its covalent molecular, exists as Cl2, and so therefore when we boil it, we are also breaking London dispersion forces. However, the London dispersion forces in chlorine are stronger than they are in argon because chlorine has more electrons per particle due to it being diatomic. So these questions in the exam are generally worth three marks. You get one mark for stating the structures of both substances and ideally include the chemical formulas in that part of your answer. You get the second mark for identifying then what types of intermolecular attractions are broken when it melts or boils. And then the third mark comes from then stating which of the two substances has the stronger intermolecular forces and why. So look for what the structure is, identify the type of bonding broken when it's melting or boiling, and then give a statement explaining which of those types of bonding is stronger and why. Okay, our next comparison is not as common in an exam, but it is useful to look at the different structures. So this time we're going to compare silicon and phosphorus. So silicon's melting point is 1414 degrees Celsius, whereas phosphorus's melting point is 44 degrees Celsius. So this is a huge difference this time. So again, to look at why this is, we look at the structure of each substance. And then secondly, therefore, what type of bonds or attractions are broken when it is melting. So silicon is a covalent network structure. If a substance is a covalent network, you just write its symbol in. There's no subscript number or anything after it because we don't know how many silicon atoms are in the network. So therefore, if it's a covalent network, the bonds that are broken when it melts are covalent bonds. Phosphorus, it exists as a covalent molecular structure as P4, and therefore when it's melting, you're going to be breaking LDS. Now, when we're comparing these, we know that covalent bonds are much stronger than London dispersion forces, which is therefore why the melting point of silicon is much higher than phosphorus P4. Okay, so it's the same process every time. Identify the structure, identify the bonds or attractions that are broken, and then give the statement as to which one's stronger. Now we're going to look at comparing some compounds. So we've got phosphine, which is pH3, and hydrogen sulphide, which is H2S. You won't find their boiling points in the data booklet, but I looked them up on Google for the purposes of this comparison. But the SK will either tell you what they are in the question or just tell you which one's got the higher one without giving you the exact numbers. So they may just tell you that hydrogen sulphide has a higher boiling point than phosphine and ask you to fully explain why that is. So that's what we're going to do now. So remember, the first thing we need to do is identify the structure. So they both are covalent molecular. So then now we need to identify what type of bonds are broken when they melt. So because they are compounds, it's not as straightforward as just saying, oh, it's LDFs. That only applies when it's covalent molecular elements or monoatomic elements. So if you're dealing with a compound, we need to then first of all look at the electronegativities of the atoms that are bonded together and see if there's any polarity. So if we look at the electronegativities for phosphorus and hydrogen, we will find that they are the, exactly the same, which means there's no polarity in this molecule. So it is nonpolar, which means that the bonds that are broken when it is boiling are just LDFs. Okay, if you need to brush up on this knowledge, then I ha do have a video on identifying the types of van der Waals forces that you can find on the Higher Chemistry playlist. If we look at the hydrogen sulphide then, and we look at the electronegativities of sulphur and hydrogen, we will find that sulphur is more electronegative than hydrogen. So that means the sulphur ends up as delta minus, and the hydrogens end up as delta plus. Because it's got this angular molecular shape, it will therefore have a permanent dipole. So it is polar and has a permanent dipole, which means that it will either have hydrogen bonding or permanent dipole to permanent dipole interactions. We always check for the hydrogen bonding first because that's a specific requirement that needs to be met. Is hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, oxygen or fluorine? No, which means that by default it's not hydrogen bonding it's just a permanent dipole to permanent dipole interaction. 
But now that we've identified the type of structure and the type of bonding or attraction that's broken when it's boiling, we can now do our comparison statement. So we know that permanent dipole to permanent dipole interactions are stronger than LDFs, which is why hydrogen sulfide's boiling point is higher than phosphines. Don't let the negative numbers confuse you. Minus 60 is a higher number than minus 87.7 if you think of it on like a temperature scale. Um, if the temperature outside was minus 60, that is warmer than if it was minus 87. But let's hope it never gets to those temperatures outside in Scotland. You just never know. So for our comparative statement, we can write something along the lines of that as permit dipole to permit dipole interactions are stronger than LDFs, the boiling point of H2S is higher than pH3. So again, going through the exact same process of identifying the structure, identifying the type of interactions that are broken when it's melting or boiling, and then your comparison statement stating which of those interactions is stronger. A question you will sometimes get that seems really, really random on these sorts of things is why are the molecules a good comparison? So if you're asked why molecules are good to compare in relation to their van der Waals forces or melting and boiling point, it's always because their LDFs will be the st same strength. So if we were to look at phosphine and hydrogen sulfide, phosphine has 18 electrons per molecule because phosphorus is atomic number 15, hydrogen is atomic number 1, so 15 plus 3 is 18. Hydrogen sulfide, sulfur is element number 16, so 16 plus 2 again is 18 electrons, so they both have 18 electrons. And so because they have the same number of electrons per particle, they will have the same strength of LDFs. So any difference in their melting or boiling point comes down to the other van der Waals forces that are present. So the only thing that's making hydrogen sulfide's boiling point higher than phosphines is the fact that it's got permanent dipole to permanent dipole interactions as well as LDFs. But because they are stronger, they're the ones that are going to be, need to be broken for it to melt. For our last comparison, we're going to look at propan 1 alt and propan 1 2 3 triol, which you should affectionately know as glycerol from Unit 2. So, again, same process, we identify what type of Vanderbilt scores they both have. So, straight away, we can see they've got hydroxyl groups, which, by rule of thumb, if a molecule has a hydroxyl group, it means it will have hydrogen bonding between its molecules. So, when both of these substances boil, they are both going to have hydrogen bonding being broken. So if we're comparing these two, and we know they both have hydrogen bonding between their molecules, we want to try and work out which one's still going to have the higher boiling point, then it's going to come down to the difference in strength of their hydrogen bonding. So in order to look at which one's got the stronger hydrogen bonding, we want to look at how many hydroxyl groups do each of them have, because it's the hydroxyl groups that will take part in the hydrogen bonding. So propan one all's got one hydroxyl group, propan 1, 2, 3 triol has got three, which means the hydrogen bonding in propan 1, 2, 3 triol will be much stronger, meaning that propan 1, 2, 3 triol should have a higher boiling point. So because propan 1, 2, 3 triol has more hydroxyl groups, it's going to have stronger hydrogen bonding than propan 1 all, which means it will have the higher boiling point. In summary, when you're asked about the melting or boiling point of a substance, first look at what structure is, then look, use that to help you work out what types of bonds or attractions are broken when it's melting or boiling, and then compare the strength of those types of bonding within the two substances. And that should be the key to your three marks in your SQA exam.